Calimera and welcome to Stupid Ancient History, Stupid Air Level Greeks. Uh, the sun's sort of shining, it's super windy, I'm wearing a toga as always and today we're going to look at the Ionian War and the final stages and surrender in the Peloponnesian War. And previously on Stupid Air Level Greeks we've seen an increasingly disastrous chain of events for Athens Basically, from 431, it all went pretty badly. Most recently, we've seen this spectacularly bad and terribly failed campaign in Sicily where everything that could go wrong did go wrong. Let's not forget chopping the wangs off those statues. That was really a bad start. So the failed Sicilian campaign and the impact on, of that... We've seen, as if that's not enough, in 413, the Spartans start occupying Desolea and cutting off the Athenian food supplies that start to strangle Athens more and more. Um, we've also seen the Persians have started to raise their heads again. They're coming back on side with the Peloponnesians, albeit slowly at first. Oh, and let's not forget all the political turmoil that's going on in Athens largely because of Alcibiades as well. So as if all that isn't bad enough, we now enter the final clunky stages of the war. Um, and it's called the Ionian Wars because most of the events, hopefully you'll see the little map that we'll keep coming back to, most of the events that happen throughout these final stages don't happen in mainland Greece or the Peloponnese, they all happen over in these Ionian states on the other side of the Aegean. Um, these were obviously former Athenian allies but as the war has dragged on and people like Cleon have been chipping away at the foundations of the Athenian Empire, these are more and more now breakaway states who are in open rebellion against Athens. So the first key development in these Ionian wars or in this Ionian war is the sidelining of Tissaphernes. If you remember, Tissaphernes is the Persian satrap who um, saw an interest in backing the Peloponnesians against Athens, but let's not forget he was being really slow about this. He was your classic kind of, oh, I sent the email, or the checks in the post kind of guy. He's not necessarily supporting Sparta, he just wants to weaken all of the Greeks. Probably got an idea in his head that if they are if they weaken each other then he could probably suggest to the Persian powers that be that they could go and take it. What happens with the Ionian was is he starts to get sidelined. His slow response to things and his miserliness, his tightness in giving money um, falls to the side because while he's been deliberately slow and useless another Persian satrap with a much better name, Pharnabazus um, he decides he wants to get in on the act and he is much more forthcoming with things like cash and resources. So the Spartans effectively start ignoring Tissaphernes because, you know, what's he ever done for them? Because they've, they've got a new sugar daddy in Pharnabazus and he provides Sparta with all the support and resources that they need. And he does this quite quickly and he gives them signs of encouragement. So with this newfound backing and a little bit more confidence, the Spartans do something quite different. They change their traditional tactics and they now start to occupy the Hellespont. Now this, if you've been paying attention to Sparta generally, is quite unusual. Sparta, we know, don't like being far away from Sparta. Um, we saw this during the Persian Wars that if it wasn't, if it was north of the Hellas, if it was north of the oh, Isthmus of Corinth, sorry my brain just now lived, if, it's not, if it was north of the Isthmus of Corinth they weren't that bothered, they were happy to let Athens burn under Xerxes as long as no one came near them. So this is really unusual that they're campaigning so far away, but it's not that silly of an idea. Um, ultimately now the Hellespont represents the last main trade route Athens have, particularly with 
the Black Sea states beyond the Hellespont who are providing Athens with grain. Um, the Spartans are occupying Desolea. The Attic landscape itself is a bit too craggy and dry to provide food. So this is the last route into Athens, effectively. So the Spartans are quite keen to cut this right off. So they start occupying the Hellas Point in a significant way. So obviously being less than pleased with what Sparta are doing, Athens do what they do and they send a fleet to the Hellas Point to engage the Spartans. And they do this in two places. The first one is Synesium and the other is Abydos. They're both on your map. Uh, and in both cases, the Athenians win quite significantly. Um, this obviously massively boosts Athenian confidence. And it seems like, well, actually, bad as things are, we seem to be actually holding our own against Sparta. Now, interestingly, 411, this battle at Abydos, is where Thucydides' narrative ends. Largely because, you know, he died. Um, but this is the last kind of event he looks at. So where we pick up with the sources then is from a, a Greek writer called Xenophon, who writes a book called Hellenica, or In My Time, which picks up pretty much where Thucydides left off. Um, Xenophon's nowhere near as detailed as Thucydides, but he's an adequate writer, and we'll come back to him later, definitely. So, by the time of the Battle of Abydos in 411, uh, the Athenians are feeling more confident. They've won these two quick strikes, these quick battles. Sparta are now digging in. Sparta now settle on a war of attrition to hold the Hellespont as long as they can and just not necessarily defeat the Athenians, but just wear them down. They've realised they can't, it doesn't seem like they can hit a final blow to Athens. They've got to slowly wear them down. And then the following year, 410 BC, this takes a very, very similar pattern. The Spartans are firmly entrenched in the Hellespont and again trying to dislodge them. Athens send another fleet to attack Sparta and this time they attack at a place called Caesicus which is also on your map. This again goes in Athens' favour. They severely damage the Spartan fleet and the Spartan forces, but they don't dislodge them. The Spartans are still occupying the Hellespont. What does happen, however, as a result of this following year of basically the same, um, is that Sparta push towards an end to hostilities. They sue Athens for peace. They approach them trying to come to some kind of amnesty, if not absolute peace. Now the problem here, just when you think finally it's coming to an end, by 410, after all the shenanigans of um, mini oligarchies and Alcibiades stirring the pot and all kinds of shenanigans in Athens, um, by 410, full democracy had been returned to Athens um, and they were having none of this Spartan surrender. Um, it was outright rejected by what who's described as the new demagogue, a guy called Cleophon, handily not too dissimilar in name and character to Cleon, but he, he's the new demagogue in town. He's the new leader of the Athenians and a rabble rouser. And because they've had two years of reasonable victories against Sparta, Cleophon um, convinces the Athenians that actually, why, why are we going to surrender to Sparta? Why would we go down this route? We're, it seems like we're starting to win. We've won three different battles and the Spartans are now coming to us asking for peace. No, let's not have this. Let's carry on. Not really the best of idea in hindsight, is it? So if we skip back to Sparta briefly while we've looked at the changing political picture in Athens and how they're really digging in uh, and really cocky and confident of themselves. After this string of defeats, um, Pharnabazus 
does what every good backer should do. He steps up his support and he now offers to pay for and resource the Peloponnesians with an entirely new fleet. I mean, this guy is either got money to burn, which he probably did, or he is now definitely committed to this cause, arguably more committed than the Spartans who were trying to surrender or ask for peace. But no, he's he's committed. He's going to buy them a whole brand new fleet, and he does. It's not just an empty promise. But the problem is this will take a while to get ready. It's not like he can just nip down Halfords and buy a new fleet of ships. They've got to build them, train the men and prepare them. So if we skip forward then to 407, as this fleet is nearing completion, it's been three years of chopping down trees and building ships, um, we see a new formal agreement between Darius II, the Persian king, and Sparta. Now this is significant. Um, it's similar to what's gone before, but what's different here is Darius, the king of Persia, is now formally putting all of the weight of the Persian Empire behind the Spartans. It's not just him giving the nod to a satrap here or there to help out if it's beneficial. This is Darius II um, ideally doing what Darius I could not do and remembering the Athenians, taking revenge on the Athenians. They're fully backing Sparta. At the same time though, I mean, this is wheels within wheels and deals within deals. We're also told that at the same time, it seems Athens have been trying to negotiate their own, de their own deal. The long drawn out conflict has seriously weakened them economically, uh, militarily, all over the shop. So the support of Persia would help. But, uh, the Athenian messenger, the Athenian emissaries, though, we're told, were held captive by Darius II. Um, partly so that the Athenians wouldn't get an early warning about what was going on with Persia and Sparta. But also, there's, a, there's still, you can argue, a degree of this long-standing enmity between the two states. Uh, if we look back at Greece, though, once this deal's been set, in Sparta, a man called Lysander is appointed the military leader of the Spartan forces. Now, he is a big deal. Lysander is very much kind of, think of him as Brassid Ass Mark II, but at sea. Um, he is an E4, same as Brassid Ass was, so he's not a king, he was an elected councilman. He is a very key strategic thinker, he's innovative. He's very popular with the Persians, particularly Darius's son. It's almost like they have a little bit of a bromance going on. But Lysander is a canny, cunning um, guy who really knows how to get things done. What's really interesting about Lysander, actually, is that he's not a, not technically a proper Spartan. He's what's called a Mothaki or a Mothax. He is kind of an adopted Spartan, adopted as a young boy by a significant Spartan family who will have gone through the agogi and all the Spartan training and to have risen to the position of ephor as a Mothax or a Motharchy as one of these not true Spartans is really really incredible and very very rare but it shows us his kind of determination, his tenacity um, and his can-do approach to things, which he, clearly he's going to bring to the battlefield. In Athens, Alcibiades is back. Um, he returns to Athens, great applause, um, they sort of forget those statue wang incidents and so on. And with his old, this old silver tongue devil, he's put back in charge of the Athenian fleet. Because, you know, they're clearly running out of guys to run fleets. And he's given them basically what's left of the Athenian treasury, a huge amount of resources to bolster this Athenian fleet. They've been successful previously. He's given a lot of resources, but with that, the Athenian Senate, the Assembly, really do expect significant results and quite quickly. So, as we've seen from previous happenings with Alcibiades, he's not necessarily one to 
take a job too seriously or see through things through to the end, is he? So whilst he's off on another job or another mission, Alcibiades leaves the Athenian fleet in the hands of his second in command. This is a guy called Antiochus. Now Alcibiades gives this guy clear instructions to avoid, where possible, do not get into a scrap, avoid battles, um, because he doesn't necessarily think the Athenians are in that strong a position yet. Antiochus, however, completely ignores Alcibiades' instructions and decides to sail the fleet very, very close to the port of Ephesus on the Ionian coast. This is where the Peloponnesian fleet were harboured. As they see the Athenians sailing ever closer, the Peloponnesians clearly not too keen on this, and Lysander, who's in Ephesus with this fleet, gives the order and the Peloponnesians sail out to meet this Athenian fleet and attack them. Turns out this was a really bad idea for Antiochus to do because he is killed and 15 Athenian ships are sunk. So it's, a bit, it's not a massive catastrophe, but it's not good. Certainly, um, in terms of Spartan leadership, Alcibiades is able to score a very quick win, almost without trying, um, and he becomes instantly kind of the, one of the heroes of the Spartan war effort. His reputation only gets better. In Athens, though, because of his hands-off approach, or just because why not, it happens all the time, Alcibiades is yet again banished. So off he goes. Nice to see you again, Alcibiades. It's not been very long. He turns up, he messes up, he does one. Business as usual. So, just at the point where it really looks like Athens just cannot catch a break. They've had these few victories, but it's not working. Just when they think they cannot catch a break, Lysander is forced to step down from his command of the Peloponnesian forces. As an E4, he's only allowed to... He's got to be elected every year, and he's only allowed to serve in these significant positions for a year. It's one of the Spartan mechanisms to avoid tyranny and corruption. Good news for Athens, though. He is replaced by a guy called Callicratidas, who is... He, he's no Lysander, um, he's not a big fan of working with the Persians, so he, he rubs them up the wrong way and they're a little less forthcoming. Um, and he's certainly a bit more little c conservative than Lysander, he's not as daring. But he does still want to continue the war effort and push against Athens. So, in 406 he takes the Peloponnesian fleet and heads out to engage the Athenian fleet at a place called Arginousae, which is just off the Ionian coast near Lesbos. Now this is a complete disaster. Sparta lose 77 ships and the battle. So straight away Callicratidas not doing a great job. However, it's not all foot sunshine and roses for Athens. The Athenians lose 25 ships which at this point they probably couldn't afford to lose because it's not like they've got a lot of allies left. But what's worse is after the battle, rather than fishing the bodies of the dead out of the sea so they can be taken back to Athens for burial, the Athenians just leave them, you know, floating around, shark bait, not a great ending to those loyal soldiers. So when they get back to Athens and people find out what's happened, this causes a huge outcry. The Athenians are clearly not happen, happy that you know their relatives, their sons, their fathers, their brothers have been left to be fish food on the other side of the sea. So what happens is the Athenians, completely enraged by this, uh, charge and execute the generals who are responsible for this. So again, the Athenians are culling their own leadership. So as the Athenians are well, effectively militarily cutting their nose off to spite the face, killing any general or 
ousting any general who's ever had any success against the Spartans, things turn even worse for them on the other side of the Aegean. So in 405, there's a conference of Asiatic Greeks. These are the Greeks up and down the Ionian coast, these former allies of Athens who are now having a little conference to work out what they're going to do next. And as these breakaway states, they almost insist, not quite demand, but they strongly push for the reinstatement of Lysander as hegemon of the Peloponnesian or realistically by this point anti-Athenian forces. Now because of these weird laws within Sparta and his position as E4, he cannot technically be put in charge of the fleet, so he's made deputy commander of the fleet because he can't be the sole guy in charge. But when he's put in charge, the guy who is technically in charge is basically a puppet. Even though he his na his rank says he's in charge of the fleet, everyone, including him, knows that it's Lysander who who's calling the shots. He's there as kind of meeting the room. He's, the guy in charge is just a place filler. So with the return of Lysander as well, we said he was really popular with particularly Cyrus, Darius's son. Um, the Persians also up their backing. They finally see that maybe there's an end to this ongoing war. It's almost like they're as bored of it as the Greeks. So they up their backing. And with Lysander not technically in charge, but in charge of the Peloponnesian forces, he once again focuses attention on the Hellespont and this final supply route. Now, as 405 progresses, Lysander moves his forces to the Hellespont, particularly his ships. Um, and after a few days of gesturing and posturing and a bit of a standoff, Lysander attacks the Athenians at Egospotami, or Egospotami. Depends which way you want to pronounce it. There are some hilarious pronunciations on the internet. Egospotami, I think, sounds nicer. So, he delays his attack deliberately, the Athenians know he's there, but it effectively is one of the clever things he does. His waiting and posturing led the Athenians basically to lower their guard, almost get bored of looking at him. It's very, very similar to Octavian delaying his attack at Actium to give Antony's troops enough time to get bored and rebel. Lysander is doing the same thing just a few hundred years earlier. He's letting the Athenians get on edge once they see the Spartans there, but then get used to it and relax a little. So by the time he attacks, um, a lot of the Athenian troops are actually off in the woods looking for food because um, they've run out. Some of the Athenian ships are beached because they see the Spartan navy there not doing much. So, yeah, they sort of lower their guard. This allows Lysander to absolutely devastate the Athenians. They lose, the Athenians lose 170 ships. Um, the soldiers and oarsmen, they're executed in their hundreds. We're told that only 12 Athenian ships out of the entire fleet survive. And they are so un happy about this result. They really do not want to go back to Athens because they know, particularly the leader um, of this, he's on one of these boats, they definitely don't want to go back to Athens because everyone's going to look at him and go, you did what? So they like it. They, they sail off to Cyprus. So effectively, Athens have no more naval power. If Lysander hasn't sunk it, the rest of them have legged it to Cyprus to hide and hope that no one notices. So this battle at Aegis Batami is really, really significant. It's a massive blow to Athens, but it's not necessarily such a, a clear-cut thing. I mean, Plutarch says that Lysander ended, did more to end 27 years of war in one hour um, than anyone else. It's not that clear-cut. Aegis Batami was a massive defeat for Athens, yes. But it's more kind of the final nail in the coffin. Um, it wouldn't have been nearly significant or as important 
if Athens hadn't already been weakened by that 27 years of conflict. Don't forget, everything had been exhausted in Athens. They've got rid of all the generals. They've lost thousands of troops, endless amounts of ships. This is just the straw that broke the camel's back or the final nail in the coffin. But it's not the final event. It's the final significant one because straight after his victory here, Lysander sails south, he heads to Athens, where he lays siege to the city directly, um, until finally the Athenians surrender in 404 BC to Lysander. He's effectively defeated the Athenians and ended the Peloponnesian War. And yeah, it ends in pretty much the way it started, or the way it was thought, fought with a bit it wasn't a great glamorous or spectacular battle there's no Thermopylae there's no Salamis it's just oh a bit of a siege it, it, it's a long drawn out and frustrated war and it ends just as frustratingly as it was for especially for Athens so Athens surrendered to Sparta they have to lose their walls they have to lose their military power they lose democracy um, an oligarchy is installed, a pro-Spartan oligarchy. Um, Sparta are instructed to have the same friends and... Um, sorry, Athens are instructed to have the same friends and enemies as Sparta, basically becoming a, an extension of the Peloponnesian League. This, however, doesn't last very long because by 403, the Spartans have gone back home and there's been another democratic revolution in Athens uh, and we're basically back to square one. So yes, Lysander wins the Peloponnesian War in 404. Yes, hostilities finally come to an end and Athens lose. But a year later, we're basically back to square one. Athens are a democracy, Sparta are an oligarchy. They're not best of friends. They're not mortal enemies. But it's almost like we we'll just go back to the start of the century and nothing has changed. So, that's it. That's the end. Um, not only the end of the Ionian Wars, the final stages of the Peloponnesian War, but the end of the Peloponnesian Wars and the end of Greek, relation, Greek and non-Greek relations, 500 to 400. Um, as you've seen towards this end, it basically goes back to the start. Athens and Sparta aren't friends, the Persians have taken back control of the Ionian states, and it's like the whole thing counted for nothing. Hopefully this has been useful, informative, and not too tedious. Leave a comment below, and for the final time for Greek and non-Greek relations, goodbye.